Jarvis, drop my needle. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Blog. And today we're going to talk about a single issue from the Mike Costa run, which is from this trade paperback here, which they called Venom Lethal Protector. I, I really don't know why the confusion of naming this storyline. I think partly for marketing, they wanted Lethal Protector because obviously the movie was coming out around this time or they were building up to the movie. And so they were like, all right, uh, you know, we want to get something out there that says Lethal Protector. This is right around the time I think they officially announced the movie and the movie was filming. Uh, so because I think the movie came out a couple months after Donny Cates started his run on Venom. So this is about a year before that, roughly. And, uh, and this is where Mike Costa is basically in the dead center of his run. And we found out the movie was in the works. Tom Hardy was going to be in the movie. The Lethal Protector title was going around everywhere. People were talking about that and that the movie was going to be kind of based off of Lethal Protector. So I think this was Marvel just trying to get something else out there with that title on it, hoping to, you know, sell more books. Or I don't know what the real thought process was, because really the name of the story is Blood in the Water. It says it really small on the side there and really tiny down here. They put Venom Lethal Protector really big up here. <laughs> so I think originally this was called Lethal Protector or Lethal Protector 2, and they scrapped it and went for Blood in the Water. Some people still call it Lethal Protector colon Blood in the Water. I don't know. There's a lot of things. <laughs> There's a lot of things with this one, uh, naming wise. I didn't like or appreciate them throwing Lethal Protector on here. If you're going to do that, do an ongoing series called Venom Lethal Protector. But just to throw it on there at the you know last second, just to get the name out there more. I just I don't know. It, I thought that was a pretty like <laughs> lazy way to get more eyes on this book. But hey, sometimes you got to do what you got to do to keep book sales up and get people looking at things. So if they Google Lethal Protector, not only did the original come up, but this book comes up too uh, when you Google it. So Mike Costa here and Mark Bagley, but the story they do in this, which is the actual Lethal Protector slash Blood in the Water story, that has Craven Hunter in it and Shriek, uh, who recently made her debut, big screen debut in Venom Let There Be Carnage. So it's cool that Craven teams up with her. That's in issues 155 through 158, which is the bulk of this book. But we're not going to talk about that today because we have a one-off uh, issue, issue 154, which is called Skin Deep. So we'll get into 158, uh, 155 to 158. We'll get that uh, to that in the next episode. This episode, we're going to focus on this one single issue that was written by Mike Costa, obviously, and Paolo Segura, who is the uh, or Sakura, who is the artist on it. Um, and hopefully, I'm saying his last name right. Uh, but if I'm not, correct me down below. Uh, so yeah, so this, uh, but Apollo's artwork is amazing right here. It's so good, so, so good. And uh, and this is a one-off story where it's basically the symbiote told completely through the symbiote's POV, which I really liked. Um, so you have, look, I mean, just this art is, I love it, man. I mean, this this whole series has had really good art on it, uh, art on it but this is a really great issue. And uh, what's happening is that the suit is, now that it's being injected more, or Eddie's being injected more with this serum, it is connecting more to Eddie but it's starting to withhold stuff. I think it still has trust issues and there's some issues with love and feelings that it, it's struggling with. And uh, and it's rebonding with Eddie and it kind of, you know, Eddie sees it as a dream come true. This is something he's kind of wanted um, to be back with the symbiote. And the symbiote is kind of unsure if it really wants that to some degree. And I think it's part of that is the remnants of that chemical that Eddie used to have in him. But now that that chemical is leaving, it's putting things into perspective for the symbiote. So I like that because I always like when the symbiote is treated as a character because it should be. It's a living being and it has thoughts and feelings of its own. And I like when writers take time to, even if it's a single issue like this, to focus on that for a little bit. Um, so that way, you you know, that because that's the cool thing about Venom is that it's attached to something that's also alive and makes choices of its own. And that's what we see here. So it's choosing to put Eddie to sleep. Uh, Eddie is like, they, it's, it's basically trying to say like, oh, those, the new injections you're getting from Alchemex, they just make you tired, Eddie. So I, I just let you sleep. And then I stay up all night watching TV. And it does. It's watching uh, this news report where they're doing like a special on the Shocker. Uh, not not the Shocker, uh, but the villain, the Shocker. <laughs> so he's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Herman Schultz is his name. And he is out there, you know, just being one of the lamest villains ever, I guess. Uh, he's being taken down by one punch from a lot of different versions of Spider-Man, like Miles Morales. And he's like, wait, you're doing a, a special on the Shocker? He's like, they, I, I beat him up last week, like with one punch. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I, I guess in the world of like people like Venom. So the news reports like, yeah, when there's actual monsters out there like Venom or Lizard or Morbius or someone like that, 
the shocker is just he's a guy with gloves that shoot vibrational things that are like kind of like uh, concussive blasts or whatever but he's not really like a threat when you look at all the other threats that are out there so he's kind of lame which is more of an ultimate comics thing um uh, the shocker was really lame in the ultimate comics in the main marvel universe they made him tough a couple times you know or at least more so than he did in the ultimate books so i felt like that was more of like a a nod to the ultimate universe but I think that's also why Miles is there in that scene because he's from the Ultimate Universe. So I, I kind of like that. I was like, yeah, I can appreciate it. It's fine. Uh, but really, the, like I said, the whole issue is is uh, the symbiote here with Eddie and its relationship with Eddie. And, you know, saying like, you know, I can see Eddie's dreams are very vivid. He has all these nightmares about being chained up or being restricted, you know, um, not being in control of his life. And, uh, and he goes, but the symbiote's like, yeah, but me, I'm just like, I don't know. I'm, I don't know what I want. I, I like being back with Eddie. This is nice. I do miss things with Flash because I thought with Flash we were a real hero. With Eddie, Eddie struggles with the hero thing. Eddie does hurt me, but not intentionally. You know, so the symbiote is like looking back at his life or its life, you know, uh, ever since it bonded with Spider-Man. So you actually get a full breakdown of its history through the eyes of the symbiote, which I really liked. It's like, you know, I was in this machine. Spider-Man bonded with me. I kind of knew about emotions before then, but just like basic ones like sadness and happiness. He goes, but once I bonded with Spider-Man, I learned a bunch of other complicated human feelings like guilt and regret and rejection. You know, like I learned about these different feelings. And once, you know, Spider-Man rejected me and left me with the, the Fantastic Four, I tried to go back to him. And then he still rejected me with the church bells. And that's how I found Eddie. And then from there, you know, uh, they're flashing back and forth to modern day where Eddie goes to talk to Alchemex. He wakes up. He's like, oh, my God, we're late. So it's almost like a redux in a way of how the symbiote used to mess with Peter Parker's life in the Black Costume Saga, which we just recently talked about, where the suit just, you know, let Spider-Man sleep and then it took Spider-Man around. In this case, sometimes the suit goes out and fights crime or does things, but really it just stays with Eddie and watches Eddie's TV at night and learns from the TV about crimes and all these different things that are happening. Um, and so it's so after they go to Alchemex, they decide, okay, let's go out and like stretch our legs a little bit and fight some crime. And they come across these guys with backpacks on uh, that shoot like uh, gas or some kind of spray, you know, like pepper spray or something. And so, uh, so you know, so the, it has the, while Eddie's doing that in the real world and present day fighting, the suit is still thinking about its life and, and like uh, all the years that it was bonded to Spider-Man and then how it went from that to Matt Gargan and uh, and how it liked eating people when it was with Matt Gargan and that Matt Gargan's personality made it so easy for the suit to be like Matt Gargan and just bring out the monster side of it. So again, I think this is Mike Costa kind of trying to justify some of the directions that different writers have taken the symbiote in and trying to justify it. And I liked, I actually like the attempt, even if it's not done well, the fact that Mike Costa tried, I think, is what works for me. And I, and I kind of like, all right, good. He kind of touched on how the suit acted very out of character when it was with Matt Gargan. He touched on, you know, it acting very heroic with Flash Thompson and how Flash was never afraid of the suit, which Peter was when he found out it was alive. But Flash, maybe because of years of knowing what Venom is, he wasn't afraid when he bonded with it. Plus, it gave him his legs back, which kind of gave him his confidence back and all these other things uh, made him feel you know, like he was a part of, uh, you know, the government again, working as a soldier again, it kind of brought that back in Flash. And so he loved the suit for that, right? So, um, and it, it, he didn't love the suit like Eddie did, where the suit was like, oh, I love you because you're giving me a chance to get revenge on Spider-Man and Peter Parker. That was like a, a more pure love with Flash, I guess, in a way. And that's why the suit, I think, liked being with Flash so much. So, uh, so while that's happening, you know, again, Eddie's taking down those punks with the pepper spray things. And Eddie's like, the guy sprays him. He's like, what is that? And he goes, it's, well, I don't know, it's like a pepper spray. I stole this stuff from the, a villain called the Sprayer. And Eddie's like, the Sprayer? He's like, come on, really, kid? <laughs> so I kind of like that. Eddie's like stopping these guys from robbing like a bodega or something. So it reminded me a little bit of the movie where, you know, he uh, defends Mrs. Chen's like, you know, shop and stuff. But yeah, it was just fun. Like this issue is, is really neat because it dives into the psychosis of the symbiote. But it also has a little bit of fun with it. But it has some... Uh, real moments too like Eddie still doesn't have a job he's trying to you know find work and he needs money so he's like all right I'm gonna go sell my tv set and the symbiote's like no don't sell your tv set like we, we, you know we need it right and you know because obviously it stays up all night watching it and Eddie doesn't though so Eddie's like what does it matter like we're selling it we're gonna make a few bucks that way we can eat and, you know things and uh, the symbiote's like oh, I can get you food don't worry like let's bring the tv back so Eddie tries to pawn the tv 
and it doesn't go well because this TV's from like the mid '90s, <laughs> so uh, it's got like the big fat back to it, you know, like the old TVs did in the '90s. And the guy at the pawn shop's like, uh, "Yeah, I'm not gonna give you. I'll give you like five bucks for this TV." And Eddie's like, "Oh, fine, we'll just keep it." So he brings it back to his apartment, and the suit stays up all night watching it. And that's when he sees um, the priest, you know, the story about the priest being attacked and how the priest is still in the hospital. And the suit starts thinking about that. He's like, you know, Eddie hated that I did that. And he told me about context and how the, you know, the priest didn't know that Eddie was talking about me. He thought Eddie was talking about maybe a human being that's kind of a leech that was trying to hurt Eddie. And that's why he said those things. And he goes, you know, Flash, if I was with Flash, you know, when we were more heroic, I probably wouldn't have done something like that. You know, Flash would have told me or taught me about context or whatever beforehand. And he goes, that's why I like being with Flash because we were heroes. We got to work with other heroes. And it's cool. They did the the new Fantastic Four type thing with Ghost Rider and uh, X-23, Red Hulk. And uh, so I like that they they put a nod to that. Then he mentions that, uh, you know, the suit is like, yeah, then I became like an actual teacher. Because obviously the suit has been a father to many symbiotes before, but it's never really been like a teacher and like a role model. And that's kind of what it sees its relationship with Flash when they had Andy around, uh, that they were trying to uh, take this piece of the symbiote that was a sliver of him, a clone of him, and teach it to be heroic as well. And so the symbiote looks back at that at that moment fondly, you know, and then becoming a space knight and, and being cleansed and all that, only to come back to humanity to now deal with Lee Price and being corrupted by Lee Price again. And then, you know, and then the chemicals that are in Eddie. So it's, it's neat that it... This is Mike kind of going through that history and trying to explain it from the, the perception of the symbiote, which I really dug. So for in order to get closure, the symbiote shows up at the hospital when the priest wakes up and talks to the priest and is essentially asking for forgiveness, uh, which I really like. The priest is like, are you asking me for forgiveness? And he's like, yes, I'm the one who hurt you. Uh, and I'm sorry. I, I guess I misunderstood something you did as like an act of violence and really you're an innocent and you were just trying to give advice and help people and i took it the wrong way because i don't understand and he's like so so the suit's like so i'm trying to learn how to love again to deal with emotions again um and to let people in again and uh and so you know i guess i as i'm learning you were one of the people that got hurt in that process of self-growth so yes, I guess I am kind of acting, asking for forgiveness in a way. Um, and I liked that. I thought that was all really, really great. And of course it ends on a joke where the priest's like, all right, I guess you're forgiven. And he's like, thanks for coming to talk to me. Um, and the suit's like, yeah, you know, I, no problem. I just thought like the idea of a man of faith talking to an alien from another world. Like, I mean, we've seen that like in Superman comics and stuff like that. And I always like that dynamic. I think that's such a great contrast again of someone who believes in you know a, a higher being and then meeting a being from another planet uh you know it's just i thought that was just cool i always liked uh, that kind of that contrast and and that that uh those kind of conversations that come from that because they always do come out very human and that's what this conversation does it comes out very human and of course like i said this the suit at the end is like well thanks now i'm forgiven i'm gonna go eat some monsters and then the, <laughs> the priest is kind of like uh okay <laughs> and he's like thank you you know uh father um you know i'm i'm still learning but i appreciate the advice and then it kind of webs off to go back home to eddie so uh i like that i thought this issue was a solid issue um the artwork on it was fantastic and again like i said i, I can't reiterate this enough that's why i talked about this as long as i have uh you know because this is one issue in the last episode we talked about three issues and it took about the same amount of time and then th this one I can talk all day about because I really like that Mike dove into the psychology of the symbiote and tried to explain things from its history that maybe are in inconsistent to us as readers. And this was him trying to not so much retcon again, but trying to give a purpose or a reason for why certain events or certain act acts, you know, from the symbiote happened. And it's, it was great to kind of dive into that. So now that we got kind of the serious and deep dive issue out called Skin Deep, in the next one we get to have more fun like we did with the Stegron story. The next one's a lot of fun. It's going to have Craven the Hunter in it and Shriek, and, uh, and it's a blast, and it's also what makes up the bulk of this. So we'll come back to this trade in the next episode. And then after that, I believe we have uh, the Venom Inc. storyline, or maybe we have one other trade. Let me see. I got all the trades here. Um, no, we have Venom Inc. 
Uh, that's our, that'll be the last Mike Costa run. So we'll do that Craven story. Then we'll do Venom Inc. as one big episode. So that'll probably be like a half hour episode because there's a lot to talk about in this one. But Nativity, we've already discussed. This is volume four. Even though Venom Inc. takes place between volumes three and four. So if you buy these in trade like I did, um, make sure you put them in that order. It goes volume three, then Venom Inc., then volume four. But all the contents in this we've already discussed. We've already talked about the single issue 161 that talks, you know, that deals with um, the uh, the Spider Woman storyline where she finds out that the suit is pregnant and it's hiding it from Eddie. Then it also has issues 164 to 165, which is the Nativity story. That's all, you know, you know, put together in here, and that is uh, stuff we've already discussed on the show before. So yeah, we have two more Mike Cost episodes to go. We'll get into the Blood in the Water storyline then Venom Inc., uh, Venom Inc., and then we'll dive back into the Spider-Man, symbiote Spider-Man stuff that Peter David's doing. So thank you so much for watching the show. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and we'll see you all in the future. Peace.